What is the most valuable substance in the world? I mean, gold might be a good guess. An ounce of the stuff will cost you over 1,900 US dollars. If you picked up silver, not so much, a measly $23 an ounce. The stuff goes for about as much as a really nice shot of vodka. Platinum's a decent guess at about $930 an ounce, but if you were to guess rhodium, we'd probably guess you know what's up. That'll fetch you about $5,000 an ounce if you get the rhodium on a good day. But if you don't happen to have pure rhodium on you, and that $1,900 for an ounce of gold still sounds a bit underwhelming, we've still got one more option for you to try. And that would be cocaine. Where, based largely on the <clears throat> legally gathered data we found, an ounce of the stuff on the streets of London could cost you over £2,400. Now, we should probably be very, very clear at the outset of this video, given where it's going. Please don't try and sell cocaine or any other drugs for that matter. Okay. But if you were to, you'd be coming into possession of a very expensive substance that your local government probably doesn't want you to have. And that begs one key question. How much will you pay in order to keep it hidden? And the answer apparently is a lot, and if you need proof, look no further than the narco submarine. Produced en masse by drug cartels around the world and ultimately capable of operating either partly or fully under the water, the narco sub is the criminal underworld's best method for getting tons upon tons of the drug across the sea. They're no small undertaking to build. Even a cheap narco sub will run the cartel into one to two million dollars. But all that money is chump change when a single submarine can carry up to one hundred million dollars worth of product on board. Now, in order to understand the narco sub, we first got to understand the world for which the concept was designed. That should already be clear from the hundred million dollars a cartel can make by getting just one submarine to its target. Drugs are an incredibly lucrative business. According to Global Financial Integrity, the global drug trade is valued at upwards of six hundred and fifty billion dollars annually, meaning that it commands more wealth than over one hundred and seventy of the world's nations. But because the major cities of the world where drugs are sold in their high volumes typically aren't the same places they're produced or manufactured, anybody looking to sell their drugs first has to be able to smuggle them. In the 1980s, sea-based smuggling was done mostly via so-called go-fast boats, narrow, powerful craft designed to go as fast as possible in order to outrun law enforcement attempts to intercept them. Go-fast boats, also called cigarette boats, have been around for a long time, and in the first few decades they were used, law enforcement and coastal patrol organizations would generally have to either erase them on their own go-fast boats or try to intercept them using a combination of helicopters and larger, slower ships. But as radar, sonar, and infrared technology has gotten better and better, these go-fast boats have become less and less useful, especially because they are not equipped with the same advanced technology as the people trying to catch them. But for a problem like radar, the solution, in principle, isn't actually so hard to cobble together. Just put the drug boats underwater and radar isn't going to pick them up. Early attempts to solve this problem came by way of towed submarines, like the one found off the coast of Boca Raton in Florida in 1988. In this incident, an unmanned 21-foot submarine had been towed behind a slow surface vessel and equipped with a remote control so that it could be submerged if anyone came sniffing around. Sealed from the outside, it wasn't meant to be piloted and had no navigational systems. Instead, the general idea seemed to be to submerge it in times of crisis and hope that nobody from the DEA or Coast Guard noticed anything under the surface surface of the water. At the time, US law enforcement was surprised by the craft, and since it was empty aside from a few thousand pounds of ballast, there was no direct confirmation that it had been used for smuggling. Funnily enough, the salvager who found it was eventually allowed to keep it after nobody came looking for their narco sub. The discovery set off waves of speculation that went basically unfounded for decades, to the point where the idea of a narco submarine began to be regarded as a sort of black market Bigfoot. In some circles, the general expectation was that narco subs were like the vessel found off Boca Raton, towed behind a ship and able to dive down to avoid detection if necessary, while others began to wonder if independently navigating submarines might actually be possible for drug cartels to make. In 1995, an ex-Soviet fixer was arrested after trying to broker the sale of a retired Soviet submarine to a Mexican drug cartel, and five years later in 2000, Colombian police raided a warehouse in a suburb outside the capital city of Bogota and found a half-built submarine that, if completed, could have carried up to 200 tons of cocaine. With time, 
more and more of the subs started popping up, and eventually, US authorities believed that they'd been able to interdict over 10% of the subs in transit. Definitely not a high efficacy rate, but a good indication that a whole lot of subs were down below the waterline. Narco subs really broke out into the American public consciousness in November of 2006 when a Coast Guard ship 100 miles off the coast of Costa Rica sighted something they couldn't explain. Three snorkels popping out of the water where no submarines were supposed to be. Naturally, the Coast Guard did what the Coast Guard does. They got closer to check the situation out. When they did, the air pipes ended up being attached to an entire 49-foot-long homemade submarine. Its passengers included four smugglers, one AK-47, and three tons of cocaine, with a street value of well past $50 million. It wasn't the first submarine caught that year. Several had already been picked up in 2006, and more in the years prior. But this one was tied to reports from earlier in 2006, when two men from South Asia had been identified as having provided plans to Colombian drug traffickers on how to make their submarines en masse. The next subs that got picked up were bigger, semi-submersibles made from fiberglass with cooled exhaust ports that reduced their infrared signature. But as the cartels got better at building them, and better at building them in higher numbers, the world also got better at catching them. By 2009, the Colombian Navy had discovered 33, while the US observed as many as 60, estimating that they moved at least a ton of cocaine every single day. In the early 2010s, narco subs began to be more and more prominently associated with FARC, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, in collaboration with Mexico's Sinaloa cartel. Then, by 2014, US analysts had begun to work out a classification system to understand the kinds of narco subs that they were seeing. In a brief prepared by Byron Ramirez and Robert G. Bunker, the craft were broken up into three categories. Low-profile vessels that sat very low to the water, nearly but not quite submerged, self-propelled semi-submersibles that could dip below the water, and fully submersible vessels which are exactly what they sound like. That was in addition to narco torpedoes, the towed versions we mentioned earlier, as well as static narco containers, boxes that are bolted or placed magnetically on the underside of cargo ships. Now, we're not really going to be talking about those, and they're fairly self explanatory, but they at least deserve a quick mention here. In order to describe what a narco sub actually looks like inside and out, we've got to make some generalizations. After all, no two boats are exactly alike, especially when they're being built with no factories and few standardized parts to work with. But in most cases, a narco sub will have a hull made of fiberglass or steel, with fiberglass meant for a lighter, harder to detect design, whereas steel is generally intended for durability or to carry heavier cargo loads. In terms of length, a narco sub can be anywhere between 12 and 20 meters on average, with the largest ever found being close to 30 meters. In most cases, they're powered by diesel engines with significant portions of the interior dedicated to a fuel compartment. They can be human or remote operated, generally with a capacity of between 3 and 12 tons of cargo, a high percentage of which would be its fuel load. In terms of range, it really depends on the sub, as we'll discuss shortly. Some designs are capable of transatlantic crossings, while others uh, might hold only a small fuel load and be used for transporting large loads over short distances. But as time has gone on, the subs have generally gotten faster. An 18-meter sub might be able to hit 18 kilometers or 11 miles per hour. Not enough to outrun a surface ship, but enough to make sure they aren't hanging around anywhere for too long and just begging to be stumbled upon. Often, they'll be camouflaged with paint riding between half a meter and one and a half meters above the water with almost no weight to speak of. Inside, the facilities are almost always extremely cramped with a crew compartment barely bigger than the smallest Manhattan studio apartments shared between several crew members for weeks at a time. Toilets are a rare luxury on board, as are lights and luxury items like microwaves probably aren't going to be found in all but the swankiest of narco subs. In addition to the fuel compartment, any area of the boat that isn't explicitly necessary to keep its crew alive is going to be devoted to storing drugs. After all, everything on board a narco sub is done in service of the product. Comfort, or even survivability, are uh, just a bit of an afterthought. While the vessels are out on the high seas, many suspect that they receive logistical support from innocuous-looking surface vessels that could be refueling in order to make longer journeys, resupplying food to keep everyone fed, and also giving them intelligence so that the submarines can avoid coastal and open ocean patrols. On occasion, more advanced submarines have popped up. Crafts that are dozens of meters long, with the potential to dive up to 100 meters or more below the water, and with a functional range of thousands of kilometers. These have shown up in Colombia and Ecuador since as early as the year 2000, and one particularly interesting find in Ecuador in 2010 featured a periscope, onboard air conditioning, room for a crew of five or six, and the capacity to operate up to 20 meters underwater at long range with up to 10 tons of drugs on board. These sorts of subs 
a rare, at least from law enforcement's perspective, but in all likelihood, they are worth their weight in gold to the cartels. Not only are they far harder to find or intercept, but they're not even what most navies and coast guards would think to look for in the open ocean, given the relative prevalence and ease of interdiction for a more standard semi-submersible. Even though a surface-traveling narco-sub can cost as much as a million to two million dollars to construct, they're almost invariably scuttled to the bottom of the sea as soon as their cargo is unloaded. Carrying unrefined cocoa, the cargo on these submarines might fetch well over a hundred million dollars at their destination, while the people who receive the cocoa and refine it into high-quality saleable cocaine may well double the figure that they paid to get it. With profits like that, the price of the submarine that transported it is barely more than a rounding error, meaning there is zero financial incentive to risk someone getting caught with a sub rather than just getting rid of it and building another for the next trip. As a result, many narco-sub discoveries only come when they wash up on foreign shores long after their illicit cargo has been cleaned out. But just as hard as constructing a submarine like this is being able to build them away from the grasp of law enforcement. In Colombia, for example, early narco subs would be built in the jungles using teams of 15 to 20 laborers who would be compelled to stay on the premises until the submarine was done in order to avoid its location being betrayed to local authorities. Relying on generators for electricity, these teams would cobble together their submarines using hand tools without any of the elaborately machined parts that would have made them into, well, anything other than a death trap. Fittingly, these homebrewed submarines were nicknamed a Tord, or coffins in Colombia for their tendency to disappear at sea. But the logistical management required for these sorts of operations deserves their own consideration. Not only does heavy material and expert personnel have to be transported to these remote locations, but they've got to get everything there without leaving a trail and run a camp for the length of time that it takes to build one. Some estimates put the time needed for construction at upward of a year. One account of what it was like in one of the early narco subs came courtesy of a New York Times expose published in 2009 after interviews with a Colombian fisherman who had agreed to complete a trip in narco sub for $3,000 in pay. Escorted by armed men into the Colombian jungle, the fisherman was put into a cramped three section submarine where he and three others lived off dry noodles and bottled water in a 12 by 6 foot hold. The submarine, navigated with GPS and steered with a splintered wooden wheel from a sailboat, was carrying some seven tons of cocaine worth almost $200 million. The sub, moving at barely seven miles per hour, checked in twice daily with a home base to get navigation coordinates. Although this particular trip was unsuccessful due to the sub losing contact and being set adrift, the fishermen had had it explained that the submarine would be met by go-fast boats off the coast of where they were headed, and the craft would be offloaded and sunk, joining hundreds of others scuttled across the sea floor. Now, of course, not all narco subs are created equal, and on the one hand, there have been some truly impressive feats of homemade engineering that cartels and shipbuilders have pulled off around the world. On the other hand, there have also been some more dubious achievements, massive interdictions by law enforcement, or exceptionally awful conditions on board. Now, it's important to give that same disclaimer that we give about intelligence organizations over on our sister channel, War of Graphics, because as a rule, we can assume that we typically won't hear about anything to do with narco subs unless something doesn't go to plan for their operators. But even still, the efforts of global law enforcement have ensured that we've got some fascinating narco sub stories to talk about. A first big example cropped up in 2015 when the US Coast Guard discovered a 40 foot long submarine in international waters out in the Eastern Pacific Ocean. An estimated 16,000 pounds or 8 tons of cocaine were on board with a rough value of nearly $200 million, but only about three quarters of that could be removed by the Coast Guard since some of it needed to stay in the sub in order to simply maintain its balance. Before the submarine sank on its way back to port, it was confirmed to have been the largest narco sub indiction in Coast Guard history. In 2019, a crew of three unfortunate narco submariners had the dubious honor of pulling off an unprecedented feat by completing the first known transatlantic crossing in a narco sub. In a journey of 27 days and nights in a 20 meter, 65 foot fiberglass submarine, the crew suffered a hot, cramped, and highly unpleasant journey from South America to a location just off the coast of Galicia, living off energy bars and probably the most unpleasant choice for an already small, smelly space sardines. And speaking of the smell, the crew was consigned to doing the back-end business in plastic bags. But nonetheless, they were able to make the journey of thousands of miles hauling three tons of cocaine worth $150 million. It's important to clarify that this probably wasn't the first crew to make the trip, or even the tenth, perhaps not even the hundredth, but due to engine troubles, they were the first to be caught, thus confirming that these sorts of journeys are possible. For what it's worth, many experts speculate that there may well be narco sub graveyards off the Canary Islands and the Azores, a valuable waypoint where the subs can be unloaded and sunk. These rumors remain unconfirmed. 
Then in 2020, Columbia picked up something odd. An electric-powered narco sub discovered at an artisan boatyard near Columbia's Kukurupi River. But unlike most narco subs, this one was particularly sophisticated, run with twin electric motors and twin propellers, and powered not by gas, but by 10 tons of heavy-duty batteries. Unlike other narco subs, this one featured bunks for the crew, as well as dive planes to help it control its own depth. Its carrying capacity was all of six metric tons of product, and unlike the vast majority of narco subs, this one could fully submerge. The craft was fitted with a towing ring, in keeping with the fact that its electric batteries would only have been able to take it a few dozen miles unaided, suggesting that this, and craft like it, may still be towed behind slow surface vessels before being sent inland on their own. A similar electric sub had been found in the same area in 2017, suggesting either a common master builder or a wider trend of electric towed subs that are basically unknown to global law enforcement. Very recently in the narco sub saga, a 2023 raid in the Cauca and Nariño departments, basically provinces in Colombia, led to the discovery of entire secret shipyards in the jungle. Operating out of the city of Buenaventura, the group behind the shipyards apparently wasn't tied to a specific cartel, but were instead freelance builders marketing their services out to various criminal organizations. Although it's speculative, the implications of this are twofold. Not only is the illicit narco sub industry developing to the point where large numbers of submarines are being bought and sold by expert builders, but building expertise is so valuable that these groups are able to operate semi independently. One such builder, Oscar Marino Ricardo, was arrested a year prior in 2022 after two decades of narco sub design and construction. But even Ricardo, the king of the submersibles, appeared to leave a void that was quickly filled by other qualified professionals. And just shortly before this video was written in May 2023, the Colombian Navy intercepted the largest single narco sub ever recorded at a length of 100 feet and a width of 10. On board, the sub was packing three tons of cocaine en route to Central America before its crew of three were interdicted. In its grand history, the sub brought the Colombian Navy to 228 total captures and four thus far in 2023. Two weeks later, Columbia would get another one, and its crew was midway through trying to sink the 5,000 pounds of cocaine that were on board. This sub was 55 feet long, crewed by three men who are now facing some 14 years in prison. And in all this talk about narco subs, we've got to circle back once more to that key point we mentioned at the outset. We just don't know what else is down there. According to the US Coast Guard's own estimates, the service believes that it captures barely 10% of the submarine traffic that passes through US waters. And given that not all narco subs are created equal, it's entirely likely that it's the louder, slower, or less professionally piloted ones that are getting caught. And even these estimates of about 10% are based on statistics where more advanced, higher capacity, fully underwater submarines are hardly ever counted. In this realm, we simply don't know what we don't know. There could be only a handful of these submarines in existence around the world, or they could be operating with impunity with elements of construction and design that we don't even know are possible. Whatever the full reality of the narco sub is, it's hidden under the sea, in a place few things are ever revealed in full, and where we here on Mega Project certainly won't be swimming around ourselves. But with such a booming narco sub industry all around the world, it seems all but guaranteed that these boats will continue to do their work. Each of them, one intrepid, foolhardy crew, and their 20,000 kilos under the sea.